So we have our speaker, Dolores Huerta. I'll, I'll start introducing her. Uh, she's the president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation and co-founder of the United Farm Workers. Her lifelong journey has been working as a community organizer and social activist for over 50 years. She founded the Agricultural Workers Association and in 1962 co-founded the National Farm Workers Association with Cesar Chavez. Her groundbreaking achievements include securing aid for dependent families and disability insurance for farm workers in the state of California in 1963. She was also instrumental in the enactment of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act of 1975, which granted farm workers in California the right to collectively organize and bargain for better wages and working conditions. She also directed the first national boycott of California table grapes out of New York. She travels the country for two years on behalf of the feminist majority's feminization of power, 50-50 by the year 2000 campaign, encouraging Latinas to run for office. She has earned nine honorary doctorates from universities throughout the United States, and her numerous awards include her induction into the US Department of Labor Hall and the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded by President Obama in April 2012. I am now honored to welcome Ms. Dolores Huerta to the podium. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and my apologies for being late. Uh, just transportation uh, difficulties. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you all for being here and thank you for taking up this whole issue of food, uh, which I believe is one that we don't really focus on enough and that can really, uh, if we look at our future of our world, it can be a very, uh, it, I think it, when we talk about how oil and the monopolies of oil have affected our lives, when we think about food, I think this is something that we really have to uh, think about. You know, when we think of uh, the giant companies like Monsanto uh, that uh, have as one of their missions to try to, quote, unquote, feed the world, but then we know what that means, you know, with their genetic modifications and their controlling seeds and uh, making it uh, even impossible for people who actually, like in, in Mexico and other places like that, where they have actually had seeds of food that they've had for, for, for generations, you know, for centuries, you might say, and that a company like Monsanto can come in and say, no, that we own that seed. We have a patent on that seed, and that makes it very dangerous. So uh, when we can think about, well, if people can control the foods, the oil supply, you know, that where we have to depend on energy, then what does that mean in terms of uh, people controlling our food supply? Uh, that, that is very, very scary. And at some point, uh, we've got to think about, okay, how can we uh, look upon food as a natural resource? You know, when we think about our natural resource and we think of the developed uh, world, so the, the developed nations in the world, that we in the United States, we are the only developed country that does not own our natural resources. Think about that. We do not own our natural resources. Uh, when we think of the S, I'm using the S word, the socialist countries, right? The big S word. Well, uh, the Scandinavian countries, <clears throat> they own their natural resources. Uh, when we think of countries like Norway, for instance, I remember uh, about a year or so ago, there was an article in the newspaper that Norway had a $400 billion surplus in their country. You know, here we here in the United States, we're talking about deficits, deficits, deficits. Well, Norway, this small country of a few million people, has a $400 billion surplus. How do they get that surplus? They own their own oil, right? They own their oil. And we in the United States do not. And in fact, we don't even tax our oil the way that we should. Uh, to make them pay the taxes that they have. And that there, when there are countries like uh, the countries, like say in Latin America, like say Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, he had this really weird idea. He thought that the oil of Venezuela belonged to the people of Venezuela. <laughs> and Ivo Morales in Bolivia, uh, he believes that the natural gas of Bolivia belongs to the people of Bolivia. And of course, when you know those countries, they do not 
agree that maybe their natural resources belong to us, to the United States of America, then of course we brand them as our enemies, you know, that we don't get along with them. And when we start translating uh, that kind of uh, logic, uh, again, to our food supply, that then, you know, that countries in India, for instance, where we, we have, uh, you know, shipped them our, uh, our seeds, the Monsanto has put seeds out there uh, that do not regenerate, and then people have to keep buying new seeds, then what does that do in terms of the hunger and the tr nutrition when we know that many farmers in India actually had to commit suicide because they could no longer uh, continue to farm? Now, the other aspects of the whole uh, issue of food is when we think uh, here, uh, you know, we have all of this issue right now about immigration uh, that is in the news every single day now, what we're going to do about immigration. We have these uh, people that come into our uh, United States of America because they do not have opportunities in their own country. So this is why they come here. They come to the United States. And I'm going to talk about another uh, food source, which is corn, the maize, right? The maize started in Mexico. But the small corn farmers in Mexico, they cannot compete with the United States because we subsidize our corn and we make it cheap. And so Mexico, where the corn originated, now imports more corn from the United States uh, than, than, what it, than what it grows in Mexico. And so, uh, you know, we have agribusiness. We have these big giant farms in Illinois and Kansas and, and all of this corn that we grow here. So the small campesino farmer in Mexico uh, who only employs maybe 10 or 15 or 20 people, they cannot compete with, with uh, the United States corn uh, suppliers here. So what, where, where, where are all these people going? They have to come to the United States. So we have millions. When we talk about who are these undocumented people that are in our country, many of them are the small farmers from Mexico who cannot compete uh, with the United States of America. Then again, if we talk about food and we think about bananas, okay? Think about bananas. How many bananas do we eat? You know, everywhere we go, we have bananas. We go to the airport, they're selling bananas in our, in our grocery stores. And so with, when we think we're, we're buying that banana, uh, are we helping the people in Guatemala or some of these other Central American countries that grow bananas? Are they, are they getting the money that we're spending for bananas? No. I was in, in Guatemala and I was seeing all of the poverty around me. And when I looked up, I saw these big trucks going down the road. And what was, what was the name on the trucks? Dole, D-O-L-E, right? Chiquita banana. Uh, the, these are the people, uh, the American corporations, that are getting the money that we're spending for bananas. It doesn't go to the people uh, from Guatemala. And all of this, of course, goes back to our free trade agreements that we have in the United States. And with all of this debate about immigration, and they're talking about you know, securing the border, spending billions of dollars more to, I don't know how much more they can secure, right? But they're gonna spend billions more, three billion dollars more, I think, to secure the border. But nobody talks about, okay, what can we do about these free trade agreements that allows American companies to go in uh, to Mexico, into Central America, into Latin America, and take over the economies of those countries. This is what causes the displacement, this is what causes the forced immigration of people to come over here. You know? and, and, uh, and it's not just the food, you know, uh, what I'm thinking about like tomatoes, for instance. We don't, you know, so much of the tomatoes that we, uh, that we eat here actually come from Mexico. They don't come from the United States. But guess what? Those are American farmers. I know one particular family uh, is fought of us, a family from, from Stockton, California, where I was raised. They were a small truck farmer. Now they're huge because they have so much, uh, so much of the tomatoes that they grow down in Sinaloa, Mexico. They grow more in Mexico than they do in the United States. When we think, you know, there was a time when grapes were like a seasonal. Well, now you can get, get grapes all year round. You know why? Because the uh, Delano grape growers that the farm workers, you know, struck and boycotted, they have these huge uh, grape farms now in Chile. And this is why you can get grapes all year round, because you're getting the grapes from Chile, and uh, likewise with other crops. So when we think of the, the global world and in the global markets, well, food is very much a whole part of the global market. This, this is very much a part of it. And, we, and I know consumers, we always say, the, people, the growers always say, oh, well, we you know, really uh, give the food to the consumers very cheaply. That is not true. That is, just think of a bell pepper. When you go in and what you have to pay to buy one bell pepper, right? Maybe 69, 79, 89 cents for one bell pepper. Well, when you're out there in those fields, 
as I have been out there in the fields, when the workers are picking bell peppers, they pick them in these large bins. What, what the farm worker gets paid to pick a bell pepper is probably 0. .00003 cents or something like that. So there's a huge profit that is made in food. And, uh, and it, it was interesting too when I was negotiating with the growers when I was working with the Farm Workers Union, the growers would talk about, uh, about how much profits they were gonna be making and they talked about it like it was a deal. What kind of a deal? Like it was gambling, you know? What kind of a deal? Not really talking about we're having to grow food uh, because we have to feed people. This is the nutrition. This is the people uh, you have to depend on food to be able to live. So it's like this this idea of food is is a is a profit. It's not with the mentality that we're growing food because we have to feed the world. We actually, I, I believe, in our United States, if we really wanted to help other countries, we could grow enough food to help other countries. There is a lot of waste in food. The employers, the growers, they look at food as, okay, how much money can I make? It's not much, how much food do we need uh, to feed the nation, or how much food do we need uh, to feed other countries and other, and other, and other uh, the feed people in other countries. The whole mentality is, how much profit can I make? And, and I believe that this is the wrong way that we should look at food. We should look at food and something that sustains people. You know, how can we help people that are impoverished? And the other thing is, when we look at all of the stuff that they put on the food, I mean, this is so scary. I'm a vegetarian, by the way, okay? And I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Cesar Chavez, by the way, was a vegan. Because when we think of all of the stuff that they put in our food, all of the hormones, uh, I was listening to a program uh, recently on, on free TV, and uh, they were talking about the antibiotics that go into the animals, the food that we eat. 25,000 uh, know, pounds of, of antibiotics go into uh, animals, in, into beef and into, into poultry. And what's happening is that then we become immune, right? I mean, we, we are, we, we're susceptible. Now they have these new viruses uh, that have come up that they, there's no way that they can even cure. These are showing up in hospitals right now. They don't have any uh, type of medicine that can cure these. These are incurable because our bodies have, have become, you know, we, we just uh, are susceptible because of all of the stuff that is in our food that we eat. Uh, the other thing, too, is when we think about, okay, we've got all, the, all, the, all of these uh, antibiotics that they put into the animals, and then we think in terms of our subsidies that we give to food, while we know that we probably shouldn't eat as much meat you know, as we do, uh, but when we think of the subsidies from our federal government, most of the subsidies go to cattle. Most of the subsidies go uh, to poultry. You know, which has also got a lot of stuff that they put into the poultry feed. And only 2%, pick up on this, only 2% of the subsidies that our government gives actually goes uh, to vegetables and fruits, which, of course, would be much more healthy for us to eat, you know? So, and we have to do, I think, a whole re-education. Uh, even milk, you know, adults don't need milk, okay? Adults don't need milk. We, we, we subsidize the dairy industry. And, uh, and then even then we have uh, even cheese that is processed uh, that will last a whole year. You know, it never goes bad because it's got so, much, so, it's got so many preservatives in it. So, you know, we have a very unhealthy uh, society in terms of, of, of our food. And people need to be educated on, on food and, uh, and how we, then of course there's the whole issue of pesticides, right? And again, another profit making area all of the pesticides that they put on the food. And you know, with United Farm Workers, we were able to uh, ban over a dozen pesticides. We call it the dirty dozen. I mean, some of these pesticides were so deadly that farm workers would just walk into a field and they could be dead within 15 minutes. Uh, they were so deadly. We were able to ban many of those. I remember when I was negotiating contracts for the union that there was a clause on this one particular pesticide, 30 days, that the uh, they could, uh, a farmer could, could, could wait 30 days before going into the field. Well then, you know what? They finally had to ban it entirely because so many farm workers were getting poisoned. And so many farm worker children were dying of cancer uh, because of the uh, uh, pesticides in their, in their communities. Because it's not only the people on the work site, but the pesticides, they drift in. And guess what? They still have them. Because even though we were able to ban a lot of the pesticides, they make new ones. They make brand new pesticides. And, you, and it's not just the farm workers themselves that get poisoned because people, the consumers, you know, what you eat, some of that stuff doesn't wash off. 
it doesn't wash off. It, it's ingrained in, in, into, the, into the food. And uh, so we have the highest cancer rate in the world in the United States. We have the highest cancer rate in, in the world, and it begins because of the food that we eat. Uh, so uh, these are just, and you know, that, I, don't, I believe that that will not stop until, we were able, uh, we're, until we're able to get the whole issue of pesticides, and let's call them what they are, economic poisons. That is the legal name for pesticides, economic poisons. We've got to get the application of pesticides outside of agriculture. The growers don't know what they're doing out there, putting this stuff on the food. You've got to get, out of the, get it out of the EPA, because I'm sorry, but they're not really protecting us. And we've got to get all of the issue of the application of these economic poisons, we've got to get it into health and human services, okay? This is a medical issue, and we've got to get it under the auspices of somebody that's really going to test these pesticides and it's going to protect, uh, protect our public. Uh, so uh, you know, these are the issues that we're facing every single day. The other thing, too, about just agribusiness, you know, what happened to the small farmers? Every time you uh, talk to the ag community, they talk about the small farmers. There are no small farmers. I remember here in California, particularly uh, back in, I bet in the 70s, Ralph Nader did a study of California agriculture. They found that it was, that in terms of land ownership, it was really worth, uh, worse than in many places in Central America. They, it was something like 8% of the growers own like 90% of the land. 8% of the growers own 90% of the land. So it would be really great if we could get back to the whole farm, family farms, right? And I know when I say that, it's like a pipe dream, right? Because we know that people who really do want to start a small family farm, that they're not going to get the kind of capital that they need uh, to be able to grow anything. So, I mean, food is such a very, very big issue, and it, it ties in completely with the environment, uh, you know, with what we want to do in terms of have a better world, a healthier world, uh, and, and we definitely uh, need to focus more on food. And then water, right? Water is, again, the next oil. Who owns the water? In California, uh, you have many of these, uh, uh, well, some of them are, are, are people, some of them are corporations, uh, some of them are growers that actually own our water. Right now, they're having a big fight in California because they're trying to divert some of the water uh, from uh, these, uh, what they call the San Joaquin Delta. This is close to the San Francisco area, and they want to take that water down uh, from that area. And it's, it's kind of uh, like what they call the lungs, you know, when you have all of the, uh, the reeds and you have all of this uh, a type of vegetation. And they want to take that water and they want to give it to the, uh, the uh, growers, a lot of the cotton growers on the, on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Well, you know what those growers do once they get the water? They turn around and they sell it. They sell it to other cities, you know? So, I mean, who gives them the right to own the water, okay? Who gives them the right to own the water? Uh, uh, th these are issues that, and, and the other thing is that we uh, don't even question, we don't even question these practices. Uh, it's just like, it's been here in our country uh, that people can own again our natural resources and we don't even question it. Is this right that they can do that? There are some parts of California, for instance, in Los Angeles, where the city of Los Angeles, <clears throat> they actually own their, uh, their power. They own their water. Uh, they own their electricity. I remember Dennis Kucinich, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Uh, the the uh, recent Congress, uh, congressman, Dennis Kucinich, uh, when he first got elected to office, he got elected to office because he wanted the city, I believe it was Cincinnati, to take over the water system. And he was just a young man, and he, uh, he was able to do that. But, you know, th these are issues I think that at some point we should think about how we as citizens can control our water supply, how we can control our food supply, how we can actually use our influence to make sure that they don't uh, do this uh, genetic modification of our food. You know, some of this genetic modification, uh, for instance, that they've done is to put the actual, uh, to resist the, the, uh, the bugs, uh, to resist the insects, they put that into the food. They put the pesticides into the food, into the seeds, you know, so that the, is the insects will not bother the plants. Now, we know that there are ways that you can actually use natural ways uh, to, uh, to prevent insects from eating our food. And, you know, when you're going to buy, going to buy an apple, you should probably be really happy if there's a little bug bite in the apple, right? 
If there's a little insect bite in there, you say, oh, okay, I know that this apple wasn't exposed to pesticides. And there's probably a healthier apple because it's got a little insect bite on it. But uh, I know that, they, you know, when Cesar Chavez, by the way, you know, uh, Cesar really, uh, before we started that boycott on, on, on grapes because of the, of, of the pesticides, because he wanted people to know what was in our food. So, uh, but before he he'd started his campaign, he actually planted an organic garden. And he had all of this wonderful food that was grown without any pesticides. But there's certain herbs, uh, there's certain flowers, and if you plant them next to the food, guess what? The, 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 the plants and the herbs keep the bugs away. It was amazing. I remember I tasted one of those carrots that came out of that garden that Caesar had. I could not believe it. I had forgotten what a carrot tasted like. You know, because the carrots that we get at the store, they're just like wood, right? <laughs> they don't have any flavor to them. And, and the tomatoes and everything that came out of Caesar's garden was just so exceptional. And we kind of forget what the natural uh, flavor of food, you know, like the tomatoes, right? They're like little baseballs. Right? They're so hard when we get them at the grocery store. Uh, so, you know, we've got to just start a whole a new food movement. I know that's why you're here today uh, to be talking about this. But we know that everything starts from the bottom. All of the movements that we have start from the bottom. So when more people say we want food, we want food that is safe, we want food that is uh, free from contamination, any kind of pesticides, we don't want hormones and you know terrible things like that uh, put into our food, then I think that we'll start changing. And of course we have to uh, you know, pay that extra dollar or so for organic food. Because if, if more people start buying organic food, then uh, the other growers are kind of will be forced uh, to also stop. I mean, because this is where we have the power, right? We have the power in our pocketbook and where we spend our money, and this is the way that we can influence. Well, when we did our big boycotts on the grapes and the lettuce, it was just the opposite. We said to people, I don't buy so that, you know, they can give the farm workers a rights and stop using some of these pesticides. It was kind of the opposite. But we can, do, we can say, okay, I'm willing to spend an extra dollar. And you know what, in the long run, it's going to save money, right? Because you're going to save money on medical bills. You're going to save money on medical bills if we don't have so much junk. Just uh, in this week, I believe there was an article, I believe it was in the New York Times or the Washington Post, and it showed a, a baby that is born. How many pollutants does that baby have in our United States when they're born? You know, they already have all of these pollutants that come from the mother's body because we have so many chemicals and, and so many pollutants uh, uh, that surround us and that we ingest it that affect us. So I know that we can do that. We can have a food safety uh, movement in our country, and it's got to begin with the people that start caring. And we know that there's a lot of people out there that are already working on this. We do have a lot of organic farms now, and we have young people. Uh, that are going out there. We, we have Michelle Obama who's saying to everybody start these community gardens. Uh, so I believe that we do have uh, the inception of a movement. And at the same time, when we talk about food, we want to make sure that the workers that pick that food, that they're treated justly also. And we have a long way to go in that issue right there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the farm workers movement uh, in, in the United Farm Workers, we were able to make a lot of gains in California. You know, farm workers have the right to organize. They have the right to, to negotiate their wages. They have unemployment insurance. When they're not working, they can get a check. By the way, only Ca California and Hawaii are the only two states that farm workers, when they finish working, they can get an unemployment check. We have decent workers' compensation for the workers, so when they're injured on the job, they're paid disability, and somebody covers their doctor bills, and they're paid during the time while they're ill or disabled. Other states throughout the United States do not have those rights uh, for farm workers. They have some kind of workers' comp, but it's very, very limited, uh, some kind of workers' compensation insurance. The farm workers throughout the United States do not have the right to organize. Here in New York, Carrie Kennedy has been trying to get unemployment insurance for farm workers. She's been fighting that. Unemployment insurance for farm workers and one day off a week. In New York State, farm workers have to work seven days a week. Seven days a week. They do not get one day off a week. So when you think about here in New York, this is where uh, the uh, LaGuardia Act was first up passed here to protect workers. And which was a model for the National Labor Relations Act, which of course, which excluded farm workers. But here, in this state here, farm workers do not have the rights that they have in the state of California or throughout the country. 
And uh, so, you know, there's still a lot of big battles to, to, to make. And I can assure you, when you have a farm worker out in the field that has a union contract, if that, those farm workers have a union contract, guess what they're going to have? They're going to have a clean toilet, okay? They're going to have a clean toilet. Can you believe that, you know, until we started the, the farm workers union, farm workers did not have toilets in the fields. We got the first toilets in 1966 when we signed our first contracts. It became a law in the state of California in 1975. It became a law throughout the United States in 1985, almost 20 years later, that farm workers had to have a toilet, a clean toilet in the fields with hand washing facilities to wash their hands. They did not have that. And even today, uh, unless you have a union contract and you've got a farm worker, a union rep out there in the field, there's a good chance that there's no toilet there's a good chance that there's no hand washing facilities, or if there's a toilet that is not clean. It's a law, but as we know, laws are not enforced. We also know that there's probably children out there working in the field, although they're not supposed to be out there in the field, because again, unless you have somebody out there, you might be 20, 30 miles, 60 miles outside of the city, and if there's not a union rep out there, then probably uh, those laws are not being enforced in addition to the other ones, the pesticide use, et cetera. So, and you know, we have to also keep supporting uh, farm workers so that they can get unions eventually and uh, make sure that our food is not only clean, uh, but uh, that uh, it's, we have a human, a human right uh, component to the food that we eat. And I think we'll all be a, a healthier America if we can do that. So I don't know if we have time for questions. I kind of, I'm kind of came in here kind of late and I don't know if, uh, if I've addressed the issues that, that you really want to hear about. Also, feel free to challenge or disagree, <laughs> okay? Dolores, I know that you've had quite a journey today, and thanks for your comments and um, for your remarkable life's work. Today, before you arrived, we were talking about areas of origin and migration systems and food production. And of course, in this session, we've heard a little bit more about food systems here in the United States and the role that migrants play in producing the food and bringing it through restaurants for people to eat. And so you see this, this kind of international as well as national and local scope. And I'd be interested in your thoughts, how do you attack that kind of scale of the issue? Some parts of, of the problem are international or occurring in completely different countries. Some parts of the problem have to do with national legislation, certainly a lot of your work, and some of the issues in, in terms of how we interact with migrants on a day-to-day -day basis in restaurants or other places, it's really local. What are your insights about that scale? What, where do you see that differences are being made? Where are the inroads and where are the challenges? Well, you know, there's, a, there's a, a convention that has not been approved in the United Nations that uh, immigrants, wherever they go to whatever country that they go to, uh, that they would have the same rights as citizens everywhere. Uh, I think this is, uh, I know when we try to get a, a convention from the United Nations ratified in the United States, we're kind of backwards on that, right? Because they haven't even ratified the convention to end discrimination against women, okay? You know, we're like, we're like there with the Sudan, I believe, and Saudi Arabia. It's one of the, uh, just a handful of countries that haven't ratified that. But if we could ever get that, that convention ratified, because when you think about the fact that you have, you know, money crosses borders, right? Materials cross borders. We're talking about the food that crosses borders, right? The, uh, even our, our food. But yet, uh, you, you know, uh, anytime the people cross borders, then they're put in jail. They're arrested. Somehow it's a crime. Everything else can, it's a global economy except for the workers. The workers then are the victims and they're, and they're punished. And that, that is totally, totally wrong. I, I believe that in order to just alleviate or to, uh, even when we're talking about the current immigration bill, which we'll all be reading about, it's really a work permit for workers is what it is. It's, not, it's what it's going to be. It's going to be a work permit so that workers don't have to fear being deported. But when they're talking about 13 years for them to become uh, citizens, 
And, and you know, I guess it's like what Jake Leno said, the Republicans look at these uh, undocumented Democrats, right? <laughs> <laughs> And so they're going to make it as difficult as they can for the people to become citizens. And so I think, you know, we have to start. And it's not just the United States. When you think of the immigrants, say, uh, that, uh, that uh, go into Spain, for instance, or we hear about, uh, we've heard about the horror, the horror stories of people from Haiti, for instance, trying to come to Florida. You have the same type of issues of uh, immigrants that are trying to go into Europe. And I kind of think in terms of, you know, if we look at, at the history going way, way back, and you think that all of the Euro European countries got all of their wealth from Latin America, all of the gold that they took, you know? That all of, the, all of these European countries became, uh, by, became uh, wealthy by, the col by colonizing other countries. It's the time to do a little payback, right? I mean, that's the least that they could do. It's to say, okay, immigrants that are coming here, uh, you know, we should be able to, uh, to, to take care of them. I mean, these are still human beings. But at the same time, talking about free trade agreements, if the United States and the European countries would actually, a part of the payback that they would give to all of these other countries that are struggling is say, let's help them develop their economies, like we did with Japan and Germany. After World War II, you know, we went in there and we defeated Japan and Germany, but we helped them build their economies. So we have Sony, Mitsubishi, Honda, Toyota. These corporations were made strong with American dollars. We lent them, it was called the Marshall Plan. And then we said, you know what, you don't have to pay us back, just keep the money, right? But we don't do that with Latin America or these other countries. We go in there and take over their economy and say their resources belong to us. I mean, think of Iraq, right? Do you remember those, piece, those signs that were, when we were protesting the war in Iraq that said, how did our oil get under their sand? You remember that? How did our oil get under their sand, you know? Uh, and it's, it's about, you know, really helping other countries develop so people don't have to migrate if they don't want to. But in the meantime, if they do have to immigrate, that we treat them as human beings and don't treat them as if they were some kind of, uh, of, of criminals. You know, in the United States of America, in the 1920s, we had more foreign-born here in the United States than we had citizens. More, and guess what? They could vote. They could vote. They actually voted in elections. You know, I know friends of mine who said, oh, my grandfather came from Italy. He never became a citizen, but he always voted, okay? And, and I'm sure a lot of the people in this audience probably had grandparents or great-grandparents that did the same. You know, it's just only been recently that they tried to make this very racist, right? A very racist issue. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's something that uh, I think that, again, who makes the policies? The people that we elect to office. How, do, how can we uh, alleviate and make more humane the way that we treat our immigrants is by electing people to office uh, that are going to think the way that we do. And again, think globally. It's not just about making money. It's not about just exploiting people. It's, a, it's about how do we have a just and, and a fair world for everybody, especially working people. Working people are the majority of the people in the world, people that work with their hands, not the people that make the profits and make the money. Hi, my Hi. name is Crystal. Um, I guess on the pre in the pre the previous presentation, they mentioned about um, how a lot of immigrants tend to like um, apply for like uh, food stamps, and so like I was kind of like wondering like yeah I agree that um, turning to organic food is a lot better, but then like how can I don't know whether a lot of these like Whole Foods or all these like supermarkets like I I don't know whether they accept um, food stamps and whether like it's like if they if they, if they they if they don't then like how can they be affordable? So your question is like the people that get food stamps. Yeah. So like for example like um, I I don't know like how can it be more affordable if a lot of people that are immigrants can't like who don't earn enough and so like I don't know it's something that like my family has struggled to do like my mom. Organic food costs more money. Yeah, than organic, food organic food does cost a lot money. more money, and so like yeah, organic how, food costs more, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. if they if they can't even like bring enough money home and or can't even ha um or I don't know like yeah, it's I, too, I think it's too I think expensive. What you're say, I think what you're saying is that how can immigrants, particularly that don't earn enough, enough money, they don't even have enough money to buy regular food. They right. can't get food stamps, right? Right. To, to like other people can can get food. Um, I, I know that's a real problem. 
uh, in our organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation for Community Organizing, we actually set up food, we set up food banks so that we could get a lot of the farm workers themselves that couldn't afford to, uh, aren't getting enough food. And uh, we, we were actually ran our food bank for almost two years. And then guess what? They ran out of food. We couldn't get any more. Um, uh, we were given uh, tens of thousands of baskets of food. But then they found out that um, the food bank themselves was running out of food. Because guess what they do? And th this is happening in California. I don't know what's happening here in New York. But before, when they would, uh, the grocery stores would have extra, extra food, they would give it to food banks, right? Now they give it to the 99 cent stores. So they sell the food, yeah, and that's why they don't have enough food now uh, to give to the food banks, right? So we know we have a lot, a lot of surplus food in our country, and the fact that people, like you and just uh, the, the comment that you made, that if you're an undocumented person, you can't get uh, food, right? You can't get food stamps. So that means that you have all of these people that are st still very hungry, and no matter how much they earn, they can't earn enough money uh, to be able to buy the food that they need. It's, it's a very serious problem, and I think it's something that we have to look at. We know uh, that we have to go through the churches, but we do know that we have a lot of surplus food in our country, and I, I think it's an issue that has to be addressed. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for it, but it's something that we're also uh, wrestling with about how do we make sure that everybody uh, here has enough food to eat. We know that right now, in this prosperous country of ours, that we have uh, uh, many children uh, that are not getting ad adequate food in our in our own country, in our own rich country. Uh, so it's, it is a big issue. I mean, I wish I had an answer for it, but I don't. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, my question is very simple. Uh, you know about California, you're from California. Uh, the issue of the Central Valley of California is a very iffy issue in the politics of California and in national politics because you get most of your workers from Mexico. Just thinking in the immigration law that is just battling for passing in Congress, uh, what do you think that there would be some sort of global contract between Mexico, which most of them come from Mexico, and also Latin America now is bringing more, but. Uh, and there will be some sort of global agreement between the United States so that Central Valley of California does not go sometimes uh, workless. A lot of workers uh, leave for Mexico sometimes, and that's one of the main problems they are facing over there. It's a very political problem, but I would like you to think, since you are from that region, mm -hmm. What will be? Because a lot of people are not looking at that. And one aspect also is the role of the young Mexican women with children that are working in those areas. Nobody seems to mention them. Yeah, thank you for that. About 50% about of the undocumented right now happen to be women. And there are a lot of women also that work in, in, in the farms, that work in the fields. This new agreement that they're making on the immigration bill, and we don't know yet what's gonna come out at the end of it, okay, they're just starting out. But that they're uh, apparently, the United Farm Workers agreed uh, that they could bring in 112,000, I guess, guest workers. Well, this is kind of iffy because right now the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate in the Central Valley of California is 30%. So you have a lot of unemployed farm workers right now, and yet they're talking about bringing in more workers, okay? And the, the problem that there is is, is, a, is a wage issue. And I wanna throw this out there. You know, we know we've had this economic meltdown. We know that the bankers are still making tons of money uh, over here on Wall Street <laughs> and other places. But our minimum wage, had it kept up with the cost of living, should be close to $30 an hour. Some economists say $22 an hour. Our minimum wage right now should be at least over $22 an hour. If you're working in the fields or in the Jack in the Box or McDonald's, you should be getting $22 an hour right now. This is how far behind we are. And if they're going to bring in more foreign workers, it's gonna drop the wages even lower, okay? And so it's gonna, we'll go, it will be interesting to see how this plays out. I believe that one of the issues that the United Farm Workers had in the um, negotiations that they uh, were doing is that they want the people that are here right now that they're able to get their documents right now, that they will be able to work here without fear of deportation. So we have a long way to go. Um, but a lot of the people, uh, once they come here, they really stay here. They don't really, uh, a lot of them, as you know, were deported. 
they were deported. We had a lot of deportations. But most of the people that do come to work here eventually stay here because they have children here. The children don't want to go back to Mexico or they don't want to go back to Guatemala. And so they end up staying here. But and that's going to be a really tricky issue to see how that works out. The one thing in the provisions, and I don't know if the, unless they change them, but Secretary uh, Ilda Solis was the Secretary of Labor. She's now stepped down. Uh, but they had very strong provisions that you couldn't bring in foreign workers unless uh, there was a need for workers. There had to be a need. There had to be a shortage. And of course, the shortage is also it's a wage shortage because they don't want to pay enough money. But uh, we were able to get through my organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation. We actually got the growers to give a dollar wage increase by just doing a march. We had a big march, we called it Sueldos Justos. We want just wages, and we were able to get a dollar an hour increase. And so it's gonna to have to be a lot of pressure, a lot of organization on the ground, uh, again, to make sure the workers get uh, higher wages. And uh, if they do bring in workers from outside that they're treated, uh, they have to pay their transportation, they have to provide them housing, and they have to pay them the same wages that are being paid in the area. So that'll be some control. Eh, antes que nada, este, quiero decirle que es un honor estar acá, aquí con usted esta noche. Gracias. Doña gracias. Dolores, eh, muchas gracias por su labor. Uh, my name is Jorge Pérez Rico. I am part of a group uh, of a group from Gettysburg College, specifically from the Center for Public Service. And we are going to start a we, we do a, a different things with our Latino community and the college uh, community. And we are going to start a um, community garden next week mm -hmm. with our Latino community. But my, my question is, what is your best memory that you have from uh, Cesar Chavez, of, with Cesar Chavez? Oh, that's a good question. Well, <laughs> <coughs> well Cesar was a very determined person. Uh, he was very humble. Uh, he insisted that everybody who worked for the United Farm Workers, there might be somebody out there at some point that worked with us. We didn't get any money. We didn't get paid. <laughs> we all worked for a subsistence because he never wanted the people that worked for the union to earn more than what the farm workers did. He wanted people that came to volunteer that they were totally committed to the farm workers. A uh, very intelligent man. He never went to high school. He only went to the eighth grade. But he was always reading. Always, he always had a book under his arm. Uh, he was so determined uh, uh, that he wanted to make sure that, you know, he wanted to make life better for farm workers. Unfortunately, we lost him too early. You know, he did, I talked about the fast that he did, you know, um, to bring the issue of pesticides to the attention of the public, going like 25 days without. Uh, actually, the last fast that he did for uh, on the pesticide issue, he went without food for 36 days. 36 days with just water only and uh, having Holy Communion. And, but he died very peacefully. Caesar died in his sleep. He had actually been visiting some of the Native American tribes in New Mexico. He had a brochure in his hand. He had his glasses on his nose when they found him. He died so peacefully that the brochure did not even fall out of his hand. And his glasses were still on his nose. So he believed in nonviolence. I guess when you ask about memories of Caesar, when he would say to the workers, we've got to have a nonviolent movement. And when some of the workers would say, hey, but wait a minute, we're getting beaten, beaten up by the growers and, and they're, they're you know, coming out at us with guns and, and they're shooting at us and they're beating people up. And you know, we had five people that were killed in the farm worker movement, five people that were killed. And he would say, no, if you do not want to remain nonviolent, I will leave and you can get another president and I will start another union. I will not, you know, so I think that's his strength. If I, what I remember about Caesar, his determination, his strength, his commitment, his humility. And it's also voluntary poverty, because he never wanted to have more than the workers did. So if you look at uh, where Caesar's widow, Helen Chavez, where she, she's still alive, it's a very humble little two-bedroom frame house. And Caesar never had anything. When he died, I think his annual salary with expenses was like 6000 a year. That's what it was. So, and that's, you know, the kind of commitment that we need, I think, today, people just, you know, we can't expect everybody to be a Cesar Chavez, but everybody can put a little bit of their time, right? A little bit of their time, make a commitment, not maybe your entire life, but commit part of your time uh, to make the world a better place and address some of these, some of the issues that we're talking about. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
I did not ever work for the United Farm Workers Association, but I'm from Stockton as well, and I did dress up as a strawberry at one of the San Joaquin County Fairs uh, to <laughs> to raise awareness for, for you and, and Cesar uh, when I was like eight. Um, so a long time ago. But I was going to ask, um, the boycotting, since I grew up in Stockton, boycotting has always been something that my family has believed works since we saw it work in the Central Valley of California. But um, food deserts exist across most of the United States and where it's hard to find produce, all you find are Dole and Monsanto products uh, as far as produce goes. And people are trying to eat healthy and trying to eat um, things that don't come out of cans, but at the same time, uh, I realize in, in the work that I'm in that they are supporting these uh, agribusiness and also very unethical uh, companies that treat their workers very unethically. So I, I just want to know, as far as um, movements, as far as grassroots organizing goes, what can we do to encourage people who uh, live in these food deserts where there aren't a lot of opportunities for the, the organic and the local um, to, to eat healthy and responsibly at the same time? Well, well, I think education, of course, is a big part of it. Like I mentioned, I myself am, am a vegetarian. I don't, I, I don't eat meat. I don't eat poultry. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm 83 years old, by the way, just last week. <laughs> and, uh, and also, you know, to, to educate people not to eat uh, fast foods and not to eat uh, junk foods, right? I mean, there's a new book. I think it's called Salt, Sugar, and Fat. It's kind of interesting, uh, but uh, you know these people that make the, like the Cheetos and uh, all of this junk food that people eat, they have actually got it down to a science, and they, they're able to, uh, to make the, what they call the, I guess the, the quotient, when you, you get that taste that you want to have more of it, they've got it down to a science, and that's what they've got in the food. Uh, I heard this uh, commentary about this gentleman who said he actually went into a factory where they, where they, they were making Cheetos, and even ate, if you ate the Cheetos without all of the, the salt and the chili that they put on, they taste horrible. They absolutely taste horrible, you know? So I think we just gotta start educating and cut back on, on fast foods and on, on junk food uh, to begin with. And sweets. Uh, in our organization, also the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, we're doing a lot of work in education now. We were able to get all of the sodas out of the schools, the four school districts, okay? Uh, all the sodas, Gatorade, all of that out of four different schools, even the chocolate milk which you thought was going to be hard. And I know that in New York you had a big problem here where your mayor said you didn't want all this uh, uh, sugar-sweet beverages in the schools. We have a big epidemic of diabetes in our Latino community and in our African-American community, and I think probably in other, in other communities also. So I think your mayor was doing the right thing. It's unfortunate that some people didn't understand what he was trying to do. But we, you know, just educate people on how to eat. Uh, in California right now, we have probably over 3,000 organic farmers and they have a conference. And I don't know what the issue is here in New York, but I think if people start pushing for that, and, and maybe even at some point give some subsidies uh, to organic farmers. Like I was mentioning, they give all of the subsidies to, to the meat industry, and they give all the subsidies to the poultry industry. Okay, well, how about giving some subsidies to, uh, to the people who do our fruits and vegetables, right? We can do that. And all, I think on that, this is where we have a little bit of control. Who we elect to office. Okay, let's bring this issue to them. We want safe food for health reasons, right? For health reasons, we want safe food and getting uh, some of our subsidies in to go to people that grow fruits and vegetables to help the organic farmers out. And just, you know, just educate, educate, educate. And I know it's hard because it's hard to, uh, to, uh, to change people's habits when they eat, right? I remember once having uh, people come over to my house and I made them, I didn't tell them at the time, I told them after they ate it, okay? I made them tofu enchiladas. And they loved them. They thought they were great. And I cooked, instead of cook, cook, cooking the white rice, I cooked the brown rice, you know? Spanish rice, but you cook it with brown rice. It's much healthier for you. It tastes exactly the same. So we have to do a lot of work on the ground uh, just in educating people. And start with the kids, right? Because once kids know, then they educate the parents also. But we can do it. I think, you know, co uh, contacting our Congress people and say, we want more subsidies to go uh, for healthy food, right? And uh, maybe we can do that. There's a lot of money that goes in that farm bill. They give jillions of dollars to these growers, jillions of dollars. And we can say, okay, we want some of that money to, uh, to go towards healthy food. And then start saying, start thinking about you know, and I know this is going to be a hard one. We want to stop the use of pesticides. They lose the same amount of, of, uh, of uh, crops to bugs as they did before they started using pesticides. So the pesticides don't really help that much. 
You know, they still use the same amount of uh, crops to bugs as they did before. And you know, like uh, some of these pesticides, especially the organic phosphates, you know where they were developed? In Nazi Germany. This is where they were developed, in Nazi Germany, okay? People don't know that. But we, you know, we, we have to do that. So we have the power in our hands. If we talk to our legislators, and we can start doing it there. And then, of course, support the community gardens that are uh, in our communities, and, and we can make it happen. And we, you know, movements always start with a few people right at the bottom, and then they grow. And th this is what really makes it happen. So I'm, I'm going to just, I don't see, we, we don't have any more questions, but I'm going to just say to all of you here, um, I'm going to ask you a big old question. I'm going to say, who's got the power? And I want you to say, we got the power, right? <laughs> and I want you to yell it out really loud. We got the power. Remember those politicians? And I know you're having a lot of fun here in New York with all your politicians, right? <laughs> say, say, you know, we pay, their we pay them. They work for us. They are our employees, and we want to step up to them and say, this are the things we're worried about, genetic, you know, food modification, genetic modification in our food. Uh, you know, we're worried, we want to see some of these ta uh, tax subsidies uh, go to our fruits and vegetable growers, and then, you know, eventually go to our growers and say, you've got to give your workers a safe environment and the right to organize. You know, we can do that. We have the power. So I'm going to say, who's got the power? And I want you to say, we've got the power, right? And I want you to yell it out really loud. And then I'm going to say, what kind of power? And I want you to say, union power. Oh, excuse me, no, people power. <laughs> union power would be great, too. We had it, right? OK. <laughs> so, OK, I'll say, who's got the power? You yell really loud. We got the power. What kind of power? People power, all right? Let's do it really loud. Who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? Who, let's, okay, let's do it really, really loud now. Really, really loud. Who's got the power? We got the power. Who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? People power. What kind of power? People power. All right, we can do it. And I, I think we also add one more thing. We can say feminist power, right? Yeah, <laughs> feminist power, okay? Because we know women, a lot of women are actually the ones that control the food budget. And when I say feminist power, that also includes the men in the room, okay? <laughs> because what is a feminist? A feminist is somebody, someone who cares for workers' rights, uh, cares for women's rights, uh, LGBT rights, don't forget that one, okay? Uh, union rights, immigrant rights, and for a safe environment. These are the feminists. So the men in the room can also be feminists. And uh, you, can we do this? You know, can we hear, the ones that are here, uh, and uh, people that we know out there, can we organize them to start doing a safe food movement? We say, of course, like Obama said, yes, we can, right? Yes, we can. But you know he took that from, from us, right? He, yeah, he took that from us. When I, when I met the president the first time, he said, I stole your slogan. And I told him, yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> So, so we can do that. And by the way, for the women in the room, I'm the one that came up with the slogan, Si se puede, not Caesar. <laughs> so let's do it all together. Yes, we're going to go out there, and we're going to start our safe food movement. And uh, it, it can happen. It can happen. You know, sometimes it seems like there's just a few of us that, that care about these issues. But it always starts with the militant few, and then it grows. And we know it's, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the climate is right right now, especially with Michelle Obama uh, talking about safe food also, and you know, with her campaign that she's doing, uh, we can make it happen. When we started the Farm Workers Movement, it was Cesar Chavez, his wife Helen, and myself. Then we were joined by his cousin Manuel, and then by his brother Richard, and pretty soon we had more people. <laughs> when we started the March to Sacramento, it was a famous March to Sacramento, 350 mile march. There were 70 workers that left Delano, when they got to the state capitol, there were 10,000 people, 10,000 people. So there's enough of, of us in this room right now that we can really make the difference. And so we're going to say, can we do it? We're going to say, yes, we can, but we'll say it in Spanish. Si se puede. So let's uh, do it. We know we have to do it in an organized way. So let's put our hands up, and then let's do an organized hand clap. We'll say si se puede. Let's go. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. And you are not alone, okay? You're not alone. There's a lot of people out there that are, are actually looking at this issue also. So you're not alone. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for waiting.